ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين. You're in one of his houses of worship in Alhamdulillah our Masjid of East Plano and we thank Allah for having finished our Salat al-Isha and for waiting here for no other reason except to be reminded of him except for the brotherhood of Islam except to be in the presence of one of inshallah the inheritors of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam our senior and our elder Imam Zaid Shakir who has traveled all the way uh, while he was in Houston before that he's in Connecticut and California he has traveled to the city just to be with us tonight and he's heading back uh, to Houston, not even giving the khutbah over here. It was just a, a personal favor to us in this community. So we really appreciate Imam Zaid's coming all of this way uh, to be amongst us. So welcome to our community, Imam Zaid. Ahlan wa sahlan. Alhamdulillah, it's an honor to be here. May Allah bless everybody. Bless the, uh, those who uh, uh, sacrifice to make this center possible. May Allah give them a big ajr and all of you who take time from your busy comings and goings to come to the masjid to pray. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah wa barakatuh. So Imam Zayd, we have a custom of sometimes going atypical with our guests. People listen to your khutbahs and durus online and on YouTube. But when we invite our guests, we go a little bit deeper. We want to know who our guests are. So we're going to be putting you on the spot. This is actually not the comfortable seat, this is the hot seat. If you can't take the heat, don't get in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to put you on the hot seat and ask you a little bit more. We want to know, we want to know more about the Imam Zaid behind the scenes. We want to know about Zaid Shakir, pre-Islam, early Islam, studying Islam, and then finally, Sheikh and Imam and Mufti al-Anam, inshallah, Zaid Shakir. So we're going we're gonna to go all the way back to the beginning, Imam Zaid. Can you tell us a little bit about where you were born and your upbringing and how life was for you? Um, you were born um, in the 60s, is that correct? No. Fifties. <laughs> fifties. Fifties. Okay. So I, you looked younger than I thought. Okay. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so born in the fifties. So tell us a little bit about your pre-Islam and upbringing, inshallah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. Alhamdulillah. I was, uh, I, my mother was one of 13 kids and my father was one of five and I don't know a lot about my father's family that as much as I should because most of my childhood he wasn't there but alhamdulillah we 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 patched up so but my mother's side I do know that she was born in Hamilton Georgia he was born in Battle Creek Michigan which is home of post cereals and general foods Kellogg's Post, the cereal capital of the world, so it attracted a lot of people from, from the South. And in any case, uh, so they got married, and uh, my father joined the Navy, so I was actually born in Berkeley, California. My father was in the Navy on the West Coast, and he was stationed in San Diego. And when he finished his military service, they stayed there. So I was born in California and uh, one, my older sister, I'm the second oldest of seven, was born in California. And I think my brother under me was born there and then a couple were born. So then he went back to Michigan and they separated. And uh, so six of us were born before kind of the definitive separation so my mother uh, she went back home to Georgia and we eventually she was born in a place called Hamilton Georgia near the Alabama border in the hot heart of the cotton belt and uh, her her actually her, her mother married twice so our family is Johnson Spence and Whitakers so my grandmother is a Spence and my her first husband is a Johnson and he passed away and then she married 
uh, a Whitaker, Selma Spence and a Whitaker. And the Johnson side, uh, her first husband's brother killed uh, a white man in Georgia and fled to Alabama and hid. His, his name is, he was Uncle Trigger. <laughs> anyway, so you want family lore. Uh, so, so then they, so my youngest sister was born in Atlanta, then uh, she was pregnant when she left uh, Michigan. And they reconciled and we moved to Connecticut. He had gotten a job uh, at Sears and as a mechanic in West Hartford, Connecticut. We, knew, we, we moved to Har uh, New Britain, which has a nickname of hard hitting New Britain. It's also called the hardware capital of the world. Uh, it was just like wall-to-wall -wall factories, and most of the African-American population came from Georgia and South Carolina to that city. Anyway, <coughs> long story short, so then they reconciled and split for good, and then when they split up, we were kind of stuck in Connecticut. So. Uh, we lived in a, a large public housing project called Pinnacle Heights. They subsequently tore it down. Now it's a big, huge magnet school and it looks nice. Anyway, so, you know, we grew up. So then uh, my mother had another child, my youngest brother, Jeffrey. So there's seven of us. So we grew up uh, without our father. So it, it was from the outside looking in, it would probably look like rough circumstances, but when you're living and you're young, you know, everything's an adventure. So uh, it was an adventure. And Was she religious? Was her family religious growing up? My mother was religious, but uh, she went to church every Sunday. She came out of the Southern Baptist tradition. But she, 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 uh, she had our moments of skepticism. I'm sure if, if she, she died in 1975, uh, the year after I graduated high school, my first year of college at local college, Central Connecticut State. And uh, I'm sure if she, I hadn't taken Shahada yet. I'm uh, totally confident if she had been exposed to Islam, she would have accepted. Because there were Nation of Islam was in, in our neighborhood. There were some brothers, she admired them, because one was just a thug. But he moved like up there from, from Brooklyn. And you know, you come from Brooklyn to Connecticut, you, you, you have to terrorize everybody to establish your reputation so no one will bother you. So this guy was a terror. And, and then he joined the Nation of Islam. He became like one of the nicest guys. He would give us free papers, because sometimes my mother didn't have a quarter to get the paper. He'd give free papers, bring fish. At that time, the Nation of Islam had what they called the fish force, yeah. Whiting H&G. So it was Whiting they were importing from Peru and then from Japan and selling it all over poor communities in the United States. And their motto was Whiting H and G straight from the sea, imported from for, from Peru just for you. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, so she admired him tremendously, but she couldn't accept the the theology. Like the creed was just so crazy. Doctor Yakub, the big head black scientist who grafted the white race on the island of Patmos over the course of ten thousand years, and the white man's the devil and Elijah Muhammad's a prophet and Fart Muhammad was God. She couldn't just get with that, but she tried, but she just couldn't. She's very Was this your first exposure to the name Islam, the nation of Islam? It was, but I'll tell you an interesting story. Like when I was in like third or fourth grade, we still had prayer in school every Wednesday. This is before the Supreme Court decision. See, I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, I used to, say, listen, we have to face the east and pray to Mecca. And I don't know where that came from, but when we were doing the school prayer on Wednesday, they said, we have to face the east and pray to Mecca. And, but the nation was the first formal exposure. So I never joined, uh, but a lot of my friends, they were in the nation. 
then I, I did think that the things the nation were doing, that's what Muslims had to do. So when I took Shahada, like we, we started making a newspaper to go sell to people. And you know, we thought that's what, that's what Muslims do. You have to go make da'wah, you have to get people to join. And, uh, and then another, I'll tell you another story. When I, I took Shahada, I was in the Air Force. So, so, so what happened, so when my mother died, and when my mother died, it was like, like I said, we we're in the projects. And my sister moved in, and she had two kids at that point. And so I just gave them my room, and I was kind of homeless for a minute. And then I tried to go live with my father. That didn't work out. And so I joined the military. And uh, so uh, I wanted to, I, I was playing football and track in high school, but I hurt my shoulder, fifth game of the senior year. We had a terrible coach. He didn't even tell me, tell, uh, tell me I could get surgery. He's just like, this guy was so terrible. Like he would come to the projects, get all the kids, and like we were like winning games for them. And after your, after your senior, last game of your senior year, this guy didn't know you, literally. He wouldn't try to get you a scholarship. He, 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 would, he would pass you in the hallway and not even speak. And he would come with his car to pick us up in the projects and drive us to school all our junior, senior year. After, this is a terrible person, but he didn't even say you could get surgery. It's like just, okay, thank you for your service, like the U.S. military. <laughs> anyway, and so I, I, I just started to go to college. I flunked out because I had no study habits. I only went to school to play sports. If it weren't for sports, I probably wouldn't even have a high school degree. And then I went to college. I had no study habits. I flunked everything. So the midterms came. I flunked everything except weightlifting. <laughs> I got an A in weightlifting. I flunked everything else. And, and then I, I, I got a job as a janitor at Southern, uh, at Southington. You've probably been to Southington, Connecticut Hospital. And this is a, I was mopping the floor of the lab and the lab technicians, they were stuck. They couldn't make, they didn't know how to do this particular slide for what they were trying to look at. So we had had a, a laboratory techniques course in high school. I actually showed them how to make this slide. I quit the next day. I said, I should be in the lab. They should be mopping the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, and then so I went back to school and I just had to teach myself how to study, how to do research, like there was no one helping you, there was no kind of mentorship program. No. And then the, that spring, so the fall semester I dropped out, I got a job as a janitor and then I went, you know, I went back in the spring and then at, towards the end of March my mother died. <clears throat> It's interesting because she was uh, she like squirreling away a little bit of money from welfare checks, which was nothing. But she's squirreling away to to buy a whole new living room set, and she finally got enough money. And the day they moved all the furniture in, she had a massive aneurysm, and then they took her to the hospital, and she died a couple days later. And so then I I just. Uh, I don't even know if I finished that semester. I, no, no, I did. And, uh, but I didn't know. Then, like I said, my sister moved in, so I was just knocking around here and there and tried to go live for my father. <clears throat> that wasn't, neither one of us was ready for that at that point. And uh, so I said, I'll just go in the military. So it's called the poverty draft. So you get a free education, your GI Bill, to pay for your college, and uh, you have a roof over your head, you have food to eat, the Vietnam War was over, you didn't have to go kill anybody or be killed. <laughs> it's a two-way street. So, Sheikh, right before you get there, Sheikh, so this is now the 70s, he early said, 70s. He said, right? He said, go into it, right? <laughs> I'm going into it. 
All right, yellow. So <clears throat> any um Yeah, this is like 1975-76. Okay, so you have heard of the nation, you have a positive impression of the nation of Islam. How about Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, you know, the the Muslim names of that time? Yeah. Muhammad Ali definitely was a a major figure because his his case, you know, he was the people's champ. Uh, but my, my mentality when the Ali Frazier fight of the century happened, I was actually rooting for, at that point, for Joe Frazier. Because I was like, I was in this uh, kind of underdog mentality. Uh, but when uh, I went in the military, then I, I, I took Shahada. At that point, it was the world community of Al Islam in the West under the leadership of Imam Worth at Dean Muhammad. And then we were like called Bilalians. Uh, some of you might be familiar with that history. Mm -hmm. What year is this? This is like 1977. So you converted 1977 in the military? Well, I was in the military. Based where? Shreveport, Louisiana. Where did you right hear about I-10? Where? What, what was the catalyst in 77 Shreveport, Louisiana in the military? I, I, I started, some of you saw that, that CBS thing they did where they had like 25 of us, what was one of your pivotal moments. So during that uh, period, when I had no study habits, uh, I, I went to a party. Like college was like partying. I wasn't Muslim at that point, folks. Someone's gonna tweet out Imam, they said Muslims should party. That's, I'm telling you, this stuff is crazy. I'll preempt Shaggy Yasser, right? I, used, I recently did a podcast, right? And I said, Muslims shouldn't advocate for LGBTQ rights. I said, sodomy is haram. I said, uh, uh, transgender women competing against girls in sports is insane. <laughs> I said, all this stuff, and it ends up, oh, Imam Zaid is supporting gay rights, you know, so. Uh, what, what was I going to say before that? Be Allah, <laughs> 77 Shreveport, <laughs> right, right. what's going yeah, on there? Yeah, yeah, Shreveport, Louisiana. So, uh, yeah. Cute the catalyst me. story, how did you convert? Right, right. So I was at the party. So I was not Muslim, folks, recording. I was not Muslim at the party, all right? So all of you Twitter people and Instagram people and Facebook people, I was not Muslim. I was at the party. <laughs> And the party was in Mount Pleasant. Is this is another project? So we, our city had like three projects. They were all black and Puerto Rican, and then all the rest of the houses were white folks. So we had Corbin Heights, actually four: Melikowski Circle, Corbin Heights, Pinnacle Heights. That's where we lived, and Mount Pleasant. Mount Pleasant we call Sparkle City because at that time there was a commercial make all of America sparkle city. And so it was so rough there, they couldn't keep, get the grass to grow because the kids would tear it up. And, and so they paved all the grassy areas and painted it green. And so much glass was broken on it when, when the street lights and the lights hit it, it sparkled. So we call Mount Pleasant Sparkle City. So I was in Sparkle City at this party and it was real cold, so it was probably like December. Back, this was pre-global warming. And my mother was one of the first people to predict global warming. And this is how she predicted it. She, she said that the last couple winters, the water and the, that would drain out of the bathtub so slow, it would, it would actually freeze. And she said, I noticed the last couple winters the water hasn't been freezing. So that was the first indicators of global warming. Okay, okay. so this is the mid 70s, uh, early 70s folks. So my mother was one of the first people to predict global warming. Anyway, so, uh, um, so I was leaving and then this, this little girl, so from, from her accent, I assume she was Puerto Rican. And she runs out of her house like in just her pajamas, it's freezing cold. And she's like screaming, why doesn't anyone love me? Why doesn't anyone love me? And man, it just, it just touched my heart so, so bad. 
And I said, you know, we, we have to do something. We got to change these conditions. Like people, no, no girl, nine, 10 years old, should be at this point of despair where in her voice, like the pain and, and just whatever drove her to, to run out into that cold. Like I said to myself, like we got to change this. And that's really started me searching. So my first thought, it has to be in religion. So we, like I said, we came out of the Southern Baptist kind of tradition and uh, I said, it has to be in religion. I didn't know anything about what Baptist was, what it meant to be a Baptist. Why is it Baptist different from a Catholic, Pentecostal, uh, Lutheran, Presbyterian? So I started studying and when I started studying the Bible, the contradictions were like so great. Just one quick example, in Matthew, it says in delineating each generation and he begat him and he was the son of this. From, from Abraham to Jesus is 42 generations. Then in Luke, from Abraham to Jesus is 56 generations. And like those kind of things, I just concluded this can't be from God. It's, it wouldn't be these kind of internal contradictions. And so I started looking at the Eastern religions. I went through a phase of transcendental meditation. I paid the Maharishi like $300 to get a mantra. It was like paying a shake to get your dicker. It's like, man, I helped the dude buy his 90th Rolls Royce. But I got my mantra and I'm meditating. I was actually meditating under a tree when my wife first saw me. She's like, that brother looks interesting. <laughs> Then I went to this English class, and, and she was in the class. She's like, are you the brother that was meditating under the tree? I said, yeah, that's me. And then, like, so she became my girlfriend. Then when I took Shahada, they're like, no, Aki, you can't have a girlfriend. i like, so what are we supposed to do? They're like, man, you got to marry her or dump her. I said, I'll take option A. Like, how do you get married? You got to go to the imam's house. i like. I went to the mom's house probably the next weekend, and I got married, and lived happily ever after. Mashallah. So now that's a romantic story right there. <laughs> but you're giving ideas to the youth, and the tweet's going to go out. He's telling kids to meditate under the tree. Except for the broken jaw. No. Alhamdulillah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Anyway, so yeah, so, uh, so then I, I started the Eastern religions. I was real deep into the transcendental meditation. Like they say, if you did it long enough, you could start levitating, lifting off. I was like a lift off stage, man. I'd be meditating. He's at lift off stage. And I was, and then, but then I like, man, this is really selfish. I feel so good. I'm getting ready to lift off, and, but it's not doing anything for the people. And that, that urge, you go back to the little girl, like we have to change these conditions. I grew up, and the older you get, the more realize, you realize stuff is wrong. So when you're young, you're like, okay, I got friends, we're having fun, you know, we have pet roaches. <laughs> Some of you know about the pet roaches. And, uh, but when you start getting older and you start seeing things and you start seeing how certain things are designed to point you in a certain direction and to lead to certain outcomes, then you realize things have to be changed. And so that just the transcendental meditation part, it was really nice, I really honestly, I felt so good. Uh, but it, it wasn't doing anything, it had no social program. And then at that point, I got a book on Islam called Islam in Focus. You can still find it on the internet, but Hamoud Abdul Ati. Yes, I studied that book as a child. Yeah, yeah that got me into I'm Islam. Islam in Focus. I read that. I said, it's all here. Because I wanted to know who God was. Oh, I forgot. In the interest of time, I'll spare you. I also went through this communist phase. Like, we're going to change things with a violent revolution. So I went through that phase, too. Uh, anyway. But then when I just, who is God? What does he want from us? What should be our relationship with God? Uh, you know, is Jesus God? 
It, it just was a, a very powerful and moving uh, text. So, Sheikh, let me... You, so you, I took Shahada and really lived happily ever after. Alhamdulillah, that's true. I never doubt it. Never, Subhanallah. I never doubt it. I, I mean, I know a lot of people doubting, going through there. I never had one doubt about Islam. No faith crisis, no nothing. It was like, Alhamdulillah, Allah saved me. That's it. I found the water, so I'm not looking for another beverage. Alhamdulillah. So, Sheikh, you literally found Islam by consciously searching for the truth. Absolutely. MashaAllah. That's a beautiful conversion story, Sheikh. Yani you went over multiple books, reading, thinking, meditating, <clears throat> contemplating, and then it wasn't even a friend. It was literally searching for the truth and reading until finally you found a book on Islam and embraced Islam. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Shreveport, Sheikh, was there any masjid? How did you convert? What was there? There was a masjid in Shreveport. I was actually in Bozier City on the other side of the Red River at Barksdale Air Force Base. And there was a masjid of Iman Warthadim Muhammad in Shreveport. Mm -hmm. So I used to go there and uh, Alhamdulillah. So how did you think of leaving all of that and studying? This is 77. At that stage, who's going to study abroad and, and studying in Syria? I mean, how did these ideas come to you back then? Well, uh, so when I got out of the Air Force, uh, at first, uh, most of my siblings had moved from New Britain, Connecticut to New Haven. So I went to New Haven, but just for a minute, and then I got accepted into American University. Uh, and so I moved to D.C. and finished my undergrad. I did two years in the military, and then uh, I did two years at American University. And then when I f finished American University, we were gonna stay. Actually, I got, uh, the day before I was supposed to take the LSATs to go to law school, I decided I'm gonna go to graduate school. I don't wanna learn this Kafra law. Yeah, that's, that's what happened. Yeah, I, I reflect on that moment. <laughs> you could have been a lawyer. I could have been a lawyer. The day before the LSATs, I, I said, no, nah, I'm not going to do this. I can't do it. Anyway. Well, I would well, make where did you get these YouTube. ideas from, Sheikh? Because you're with the Wadidin community. They're not preaching this stuff. Yeah, right there, but so. yeah, we read in the Quran, though. <laughs> okay. You know, I can't say anything many, to that. <laughs> many an autodidact has been diverted away from law school. <laughs> anyway. Sheikh, did you have a personal relationship with Imam Wadidin? Did you know him personally? or? No, I didn't meet him personally until like years later. Okay. So who's your main mentor during this phase in the late 70s, early 80s? I would say Imam Siraj Wahaj. Really? Imam Siraj Because what happened... He was listen, just here two weeks ago on your seat. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what happened. So I'm from Connecticut. My wife's from New York. We met in Louisiana at Barksdale Air Force Base. Under a tree? Uh, well, I was under the tree. <laughs> okay. she, first, she first spotted me under a tree. She was driving a military pickup truck and just stopped. Mashallah, it gets even more romantic. <laughs> yeah, that, interesting, and then kept going. And then we met in the English class. Okay, and but so uh, anyway, so the masjid there was Imam Warthadi Muhammad in 19. So when we went home, we would go to Masjid Taqwa. Subhanallah. Because wow. she, she uh, at that point, she was born in Manhattan and moved to Queens, then moved to Long Island. But she had joined the nation, and she was part of the, uh, it was uh, Temple Number 7, the big one in Manhattan, that Malcolm was over, Number 7. And uh, so by then, she had made the transition. So we would go to Imam Siraj's masjid, and around 1977, Imam Siraj left the movement of Imam Warthadi Muhammad and started Masjid Taqwa. So we would go there and listen to Imam Siraj, and I was, I'd just be way in the back in the crowd, no one knew me, and listening, but, and I was really taken by Imam Siraj's teachings. Then when I went to Rutgers for graduate school, so I, like, like, so I didn't do the law school in American University, so I swore, where are you going to go to grad school? So I'm from Connecticut, and she's from New York. 
And so if we went to Connecticut, her family's gonna get mad. If we went to New York, my family was gonna get mad. So I went to New Jersey, to Rutgers, and nobody got mad. MashaAllah. And, and, but we would go to New York for Juma once in a while. We would bring Imam Siraj to campus uh, there at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And so I, I would say Imam Siraj. Now, wh how I got moved away from the uh, Imam Wartha D. Muhammad in 1979, I went for Hajj. But the Hajj, I went, I was, I was in the military at that point. So when I took Shahada, I thought you couldn't be in the military because the, uh, the case of uh, Muhammad Ali and the Supreme Court and the vindication and so I, I, I tried to get out as a conscientious objector, but they said, we're not at war right now, because Ali was objecting to Vietnam. There was a war. They said, no war. How could you object to war? We're not fighting a war. So I said, and send me to a Muslim country. So they sent me to Turkey so fast, even though it's secular, but the people are Muslim, and no one wanted to go to a Muslim country, because you couldn't party, you couldn't chase the girls, you couldn't do those things. And they wanted to go to Thailand, Japan, the Philippines. Said, this fool wants to go to Turkey. Send him before he changes his mind. <laughs> so I went to, to Turkey. And while I was in Turkey with my wife, my former girlfriend, we made Hajj on the bus and by car to Turkey. I'm from Turkey. You could still do that in those days. This was 1979. Subhanallah. And we stopped in Medina because a lot of the students from Medina University would come to Turkey in the summertime because it's so hot down there. And I met this brother from Uganda, Muhammad Taha Lubego. I remember his name. And so I said, I'll come visit you. And so when we were driving, we drove from Amman to Tabuk, and then from Tabuk to Medina. And I actually, uh, I had dinner in Imam Anwar's house. Anwar Muhammad. Anwar Muhammad. Subhanallah. And wow. they, were, they were like struggling. You look at Imam Anwar, they talk about a family sacrificing for the deen, for their kids. So Imam Anwar is one of the first uh, American graduates from Medina, way senior to me. Yeah. So met him in the 70s. One of the first African-American, Hafiz uh, Hafizullah. So I actually visited him. So I was coming out of his house, and then this group of brothers from Medina University well, at the door, they were coming to visit. I was leaving, and one of them was a brother, Salah Haddin from Miami, a big brother. And that thing, no, he, he's from Springfield, Mass, and moved back to Springfield. Anyway, so these brothers, they basically ambushed me. So they, they asked me who I was, et cetera, et cetera. Then what was I doing? I'm going to Hajj, and we're going to hook up with the delegation from the world community of Al Islam in the West. And, when we get to Jeddah, that was the plan. And uh, they said, well, you follow Imam Warthidi Muhammad? And man, I got the beat down. Because at that point, you know, the Imam was, it was the end of the transition. So he was saying some controversial things. And man, da -da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. I'm like, man. Then I, I was all shaken. I'm like telling my wife, you know, I don't know. I can't do this. My wife was defiant. Well, I don't care what you do. If the imam goes to Africa, I'm going with you. Like, my wife is going to leave me for Imam Wartha D. Muhammad. She's like, I'm following the imam. If he goes to Africa, I'm going to Africa with him. I don't care what you do. I'm like, okay. Uh, I hope she doesn't see this podcast. <laughs> Delete that part. <laughs> So anyway, it's been 40 years. You're still scared. Alhamdulillah, this is a good yeah, yeah. This we, is, we this passed is how marriages that. survive, guys. Leave it in there. We passed that. We passed all that. Anyway, so uh, so you know, I got a kind of skeptical, and then Imam Siraj had left a couple years before that, and I kind of drifted away. Then we got involved with this uh, movement. Actually, I found out later they kind of were like the Khawarij. Like their slogan was <laughs> and and they were they they were like against the Sunnis against the Shi and, and I'm like man was this Juhayman's group? 
huh? that eventually Juhayman's group? No, 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 no. This was in the States. Oh, in the States. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought you meant the Medina guys. Okay. I won't even say the leader of the, but the, it was it was a Khariji group. And then the, after that, then the Iranian revolution jumped off, and like, we were all down in support of the revolution. Like It was like, you know, Marbar America, Marbar uh, it's like, we were like into it because it's like you know that was the the revolutionary Marxist part was like resurfacing with an Islamic veneer. That was a phase. Right? People out there, all you bloggers and tweeters. Sheikh, the ones who want to find fault will find fault. There's that was no a point. phase. There's no point disclaimers. Well, at least I'm qualifying <laughs> for the record. So, you know, let's say for the record, that was a phase. And then we went to the, the Salafi phase. And so there was so, and then Naqshibandi phase. Wait, wait, so, Sheikh, you're not going to get that fast over the Salafi phase. Because, <laughs> see, in Turkey now, Turkey default, default Islam is Hanafi Madhab Naqshibandi Tariqa. And Urba Khan was, he, his sheikh was a Naqshibandi sheikh. And so we're in Turkey and so they we Nursi? got... No, 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 they were in Nursi, it's one of the Naqshibandis in, in okay. Istanbul. So, uh, you know, so we're in Turkey, so we're, we're on, on time off, we're going all over visiting these families. We went to their, they had this Thursday night dhikr gathering. They go and they do their dhikr. And then they read some, read Quran, do the dhikr, and then give everyone some soup. So it was like a free meal that wasn't like military mess hall food. So man, that was the place to be on Thursday night. So we going all around. Then they, because Mili Salamet Partisi was a party, and they were vying for uh, uh, leadership in Turkey. So Urbakan, I think, is later even was briefly the prime minister. And so they would go to the villages, they're making dawah, they're educating the people. So we would go on these excursions with them. And so we didn't know it, but de facto since, because we, we've just had converted recently, we were Hanafi, Naqshibandi Muslims. But we didn't know, we just thought we were Muslims. Probably like the average Turk, that's Islam. And when, so we came back to America, so, uh, and I go to D.C. D.C. was the Iranian revolutionary phase. Then 1983, so mm. we go to uh, Jersey and then got ambushed by the Salafis. 83? That's very early. Wow. 1983. Okay. Which, which Salafi figure uh, was there I don't the know if you remember uh, Abdullah Makawi. And they I've had this, this okay. uh, the little magazine. Uh, I forget what they call the magazine. He, 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 le I don't know. Because then when I, when I got back from uh, Egypt, so, so anyway, so we got the Salafi beat down, the Hanafis and Abu Hanifa and his methab is not based on Hadith and yada, yada, yada. And so, so we started getting into the Salafi part. But we retained the dhikr. So we were like dhikring Salafis. Munharifun. <laughs> you need some uh, <laughs> some escape. Anyway, so uh, so we got into that, and Allahumma sallu rasulillah. Then what happened with that? Uh, in the fiqh class, we're using fiqh sunnah. Say it sabiq. Yeah. Say it sabiq. In our fiqh class, and then so we move in through the eighties. And we're doing all this work in New Haven. I mean, we're doing a lot of work. We were very, very active, like in the schools, and we were doing a lot of work. We had a full program, because I, I was working at that point. So I finished grad school, did my year in Egypt, came back, went back home to Connecticut, and uh, we started Masjid Al Islam. The first thing I did, I don't even want to say what I did because I went to a masjid that was closed, and then we started going to West Haven, because the masjid in New Haven, we went to it, it was closed on Friday for Juma. And, but West Haven, some people, some brothers and sisters who had come out of the West Muhammad, 
movement. They said, we need a masjid, we need a McDowell, we need to, and so we started going to their gatherings in Brother Rashid's house. I don't mm. remember, Sister Jamila Rashid and Brother Rashid. They had a gathering of five or six people who had been, who were still affiliated with Imam Ward Fidi Muhammad, but they wanted to be active in the city. And we started Masjid al-Islam. Imam Siraj was at the grand opening. The grand opening was a storefront about the size of this balcony back here. But Imam Siraj was there. We outgrew that, moved across the street to a How many place. people, first Juma? The first Juma, I forget. But the second Juma, I remember. The second Juma was three people. Three people. Because of a big snowstorm. Hmm. It was a big snowstorm. And myself, my wife, and Sister Iman. I don't remember mm. Sister Iman from New Haven. And, uh, but then it grew, and we outgrew that space, which was a blessing, because it was us, and then the convenience store, and then the nightclub. And like the music from the nightclub went over the roof of the convenience. These are all connected. And it was like you're in the master trying to play, and it's like, I want to rock with you. <laughs> all night and you're trying to pray and so alhamdulillah that only lasted for a year and then we moved across the street to the front of the guys fort. this is how islam began in north america yeah. we moved Look across we the street to a, a, a storefront in front of a ford sheet metal shop on the back side was a sheet metal shop the front side was a masjid now this 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 story is going to blow your mind so on uh, June 10th, I think it was June 10th, 1989, a tornado came through that area. I was actually, I was, at that point, I was teaching political science at Southern Connecticut State University. I was sitting in my office, and these huge windows blew off the end of the building, and it got green, the sky got green, and we woke up, it was like a mess. Like, this is, I, I wish we would have preserved this picture. Like the building to the right of the masjid got totally demolished. The building to the left of the masjid got totally demolished. The, the sheet metal shop that was connected to the masjid, the roof got torn off and it actually landed on the masjid roof. And so the only damage that the masjid has, no broken windows, it was a little leak where the roof had punctured the masjid roof, and that was it. It, it, was, it was incredible. Not, not even a broken window. And, and so, in any case, uh, so then we eventually, that was rental property, and then we eventually bought the building on George Street. And then by that time, I left to go to Syria. So actually, Siraj Muhammad and Saifuddin Hassan, those guys kind of brought that to completion. So Chef, you're going to Syria. Let's get to this stage now. What prompted you to go and why Syria? Uh, so I was working this whole time. So we had, I was the imam of the masjid because I, I had gone to Egypt for a year and knew a little bit of Arabic and... Al-Azhar or on the side? Just like, it was an a, a ma a, a okay. institute affiliated with uh, Azhar, uh, Azhar. I'm sorry. And, and uh, so I went there for a year and came back. So I knew a little bit. In the Valley of the Blind, the one-eyed man is king. But I'm working the whole time. It's full time. I worked at Yale Medical Bookstore. <clears throat> I knew the whole medical library. I could have been a doctor. <laughs> no, I knew they had Netters and Gray's Anatomy, the Merck Manual, the whole gamut. You know, everything from A to Z. Shaykh Allah chose you for something better than being a doctor or a lawyer. Allah <laughs> chose you for the best profession. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. But, so I'm working now. And, I, and, but it became apparent then on the weekend, we're going all over the Northeast. These different programs, we're going to the UN to protest. We bring busloads of people from Connecticut. We, we bring more people than New York, the whole city. Uh, we were really active, and so at a certain point it dawned on me, like I'm getting into my 30s now, it's like, man, this is probably going to be your life. If that's the case, I need to go and learn more about the religion. And so I applied to the Islamic Medina. Uh, my, 
Abu Muslima took shahada in my house in college. Subhanallah. Wow. So I gave him shahada. In my house in New Brunswick, he was undergrad. I was in graduate school. And so we had this house. We were on the second floor. We rented out to Abu Muslima, this brother from uh, Burma, actually, Burmese Muslim brother. And we moved into the attic stealth wise. We like closed the windows so they wouldn't see light at night and rent at the bottom to help pay, uh, 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 augment the expenses of college life. And uh, so myself and Abu Muslima, we applied to Islamic University in Medina. And as was their want at that point in time, they were slow in responding. So I decided I'll just go to Egypt and study in Egypt. So I went to Egypt and was at this institute where I stayed for a year and then the Azhar Institute. And he waited and then three weeks after I got to Egypt, two or three weeks, the, the acceptance letter came. So I actually got accepted to Islamic University in Medina. MashaAllah, what year is this? This is 1986. MashaAllah, I was in grade six at the time. MashaAllah. Yeah, it was 19, so Abu Muslim I had waited, so he went, and then I had gone to Egypt. So you could have been a graduate of Medina. Yeah. MashaAllah. But you, Allah chose another path for you, and Allah chose was, another yeah, path. If, if that letter came three weeks earlier, I would have gone to Medina. Alhamdulillah. By the way, Abu Muslim, for those who don't know, is one of the earliest graduates as well, and he graduated from the College of Da'wah. He's now an imam in New Jersey. So yeah. your colleague, or he, he accepted Islam in your house? And then yeah. he went to Medina, and now he's in active diet. Yeah. So then instead of going to Medina, you chose to I go to in Egypt. Egypt, okay. Yeah. And then so how did Syria come about? So we stayed there for a year. Then when I came back, I became the imam. And that's when it came, you know, I got to really seriously study this religion. And so there was a, a brother from Syria in my political science class at Southern, Abdul Fattah. I won't say his complete name. He's in the States now, actually. And so... I told him my plan, he was going he arranged everything, but at the last minute, I lost his phone number. And so I just went to Syria on a wing in prayer and ended up in certain circles and the rest is history, as they say. But I would have definitely gone to Medina because it was free. Like Syria, you had to pay, every <laughs> pay for everything. No, Egypt, we were. I, I actually taught English in exchange for attending these schools or, or to just take care of my family. So you had to, to work to, in order to get some money to take care of your family yeah. over there. How many years were you in Syria, Sheikh? Oh, I was there from 94 until 2001. Okay. And I you... came back right after 9-11. It was a strange new world. So 9-11 landed... happened and you were in Syria? I was in Syria. I was locked in the masjids studying for the exams. SubhanAllah. Because a lot of the masjids, don't, they don't leave open between mm. the prayers. So I just told him, ma'am, just lock me in after Fajr. So I'll see you guys at Vuhar. And so then uh, probably about 10 in the morning, the, the kids in the neighborhood, they're banging on the door. Boom, 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 shake, 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 America, Pentagon, Barjain in New York, where Sears Tower, or I said, okay, get the imam, you gotta let me out. And we had this satellite television, and I, we never watched it for one minute. And so all this going on, we said, oh, we gotta turn on the TV, see what we got to focus the satellite and get everything, and then it was CNN, and the guy's talking about a Tom Clancy novel. Like, is this life imitating art? Because Tom Clancy wrote the novel about the attack on, and all this stuff. It was just so weird. And the building smoking, then the building collapses. And yeah, it was interesting. SubhanAllah. It actually mirrors my own story when I was in Medina. We didn't have a TV. 9 11 happened, and a neighbor comes running and tells me, You better, open, you know, there's been a taxi. What's happening? My wife and I rushed to a neighbor's house to see what's happening. The exact same story, subhanAllah, yeah. at the time. So, Sheikhana, you studied seven years. Uh, I read you were the first American graduate of. No, I was the second. The second American Sister graduate. Sister Nidal, 
Abdul Mu'min, who is the wife of Imam Daoud Yassin, was the first. Okay, so you're the she second American by graduate one semester. by one semester. So yeah. same batch, roughly, inshallah. The first or second American graduate from the Syrian yeah. University, Abu the, Noor. Abu Noor. Yeah. Abu Noor. Yeah. And then you came back here and Zaytuna College. Yeah. yeah. I was actually going to come here to Dallas. Some people might know that story. I, I had signed a contract, actually. Whoa, we got we to gotta talk to some people. What's going on here? Why, why no, did you not No, it's not their Dallas? fault. It's not their fault. Yeah. I don't, it's my fault, actually. I don't even know what happened. I don't know how I ended up at Zaytuna. I, I know I went to this program. Sheikh Hamza was there. It was in the mountains in Alberta, Canada. It was freezing cold until the Chinook came over the mountains and warmed everything. That's the warm wind off the Pacific Ocean. They call it the Chinook. It came the Chinook. And, and he didn't make any kind of picture or anything. I, the next thing I knew, I was in California. I'm like, okay, Dr. Yusuf's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, mashallah, qadrullahu wa mashallah. And so that's the story. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, uh, time is limited. Let me get to some really deep questions, inshallah, and then open the floor for some of you as well, inshallah. Sheikh, one thing that I noticed about your track record uh, and your lectures and your speeches, and by the way, I met Imam Zaid my first semester at, at uh, Yale in New Haven. It just so happened, as soon as he left, I took over Masjid al-Islam and get khutbahs there, but he would come visit. So literally the and semester... As soon as I came back, he left. <laughs> <laughs> then when he came back, I came to... Um, Memphis, but Sheikh and I, one thing that I've always noticed, even in our first meeting in my house in, in, in Connecticut, in, in New Haven, I was always cognizant of the fact that unlike many other people, including myself at the time, you were never sectarian. And I really took notice of that. Most of the du'at, and I'll be the first to say yes myself as well, coming from Medina, I had a mindset. Those coming from Azhar had a mindset. Those coming from Syria had a mindset. They had a particular firqa, a particular narrow understanding. But I've always seen in you much more openness and broad-mindedness, which took me, myself, years of personal da'wah and training, but you seem to have had it from before. Why and how do you think this is the case? And can you elaborate on that? That, that acceptance and, and understanding that Islam is beyond just one narrow slither of interpretation. I accepted Islam, not a piece of it. So, you know, we, we all are influenced by different things, but, you know, man qala la ilaha illallah dakhla al jannah. Whoever says la ilaha illallah enters paradise. So, yani, jannatin, yani, so the, the indefinite conveys a meaning of, of plurality. There's more than one Jannah. Jannatul 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 Adin, Jannatul Naim, Jannatul Ma'wa, Jannatul Firdaus. And each one is more expansive than the spans of heavens and earth. That's a lot of space. Why should we only want five people in? <laughs> like Mashallah. me Mashallah. And, and my my four students, <laughs> and everyone else can take a, a, a slow boat to the hot place. That's insane, you know. And 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 you know. So, the fourteen hundred years. The unity that this ummah has, despite the various differences, uh, we don't even have what would be properly considered uh, a, a, a sect in the, in, the, in the Protestant Catholic sense as Muslims. Uh, we all pray five prayers. Uh, some of the Shia and Itha and the Ibadiyya, they usually join Dhu and Asr and Maghrib and Isha in their congregations, but everyone recognizes five prayers. We, all, we fast the same month of Ramadan, all Muslims. We might have a day or difference, they start a day or difference, you know. You, you, you start on Monday, I start on Sunday. You say tomato, I say tomato. <laughs> you know, we all go to the same Hajj at the same time. We all read the same Quran. I've been to Iran, there's no Mus'haf Fatima. 
the Mosaf is printed in Beirut, just like the ones we all read. And so, I mean, the unity is, is miraculous. Mm. After 1400 years of mm. Turks and Arabs and mm. West Africans, North Africans, East Africans, Central Asians, Southeast Asians, Europeans, Andalusia, the Balkans, and all, all of all of all of that and we still have that degree of unity Mashallah. it's, it's Mashallah. not my place to like kick someone out of islam because they maintain all that we have in common over some petty minor differences Mashallah. you know I, it never made sense to me Mashallah. Mashallah. It, it absolutely just never made sense uh, and i i yeah. couldn't i couldn't do that and i have to say in front of everybody that <clears throat> It was your presence and interacting with you when I, because I had first come from Medina in 2005 and I had started Yale 2005. And Imam Zaid visited me in my house and we had, it was the beginning of my own opening up and, and rethinking through. So your presence and talking to you and, and, and seeing, frankly, I mean, mashallah, you're so much senior to me age-wise, wisdom-wise. Talking with you and interacting with you was one of the catalysts for me to also start rethinking through and opening up. So alhamdulillah, you've had a, a very positive impact on my own uh, development, Sheikh. No, no, uh, no, so, I always admire Sheikh Yasir because it takes a lot of courage to do what he did. So, alhamdulillah, ask Allah for qabul. I won't say any more. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh. So, Sheikh, another thing, Sheikh, um, let's get to one of the more interesting questions now. You've been active in America from the 70s, mashallah. You've seen the evolution of Islam. You've seen the growth of Islam. I asked Imam Siraj a similar question. I'll ask you a similar question as well. What do you see as some of the challenges that we now have that you guys didn't have back in the 70s? Some of the pros and cons, some of the positives and negatives that, mashallah, you've been a Muslim for 40 plus years, 45 years now, mashallah. You've been active. You've been living in different continents. You've been through multiple phases, as you said. Now that you look back with your wisdom, with your experience, it's 2022 now, what are some of the lessons you can leave for the next generation? Some of the problems that you see that, that you know, we need to, to nip in the bud, as they say. So can you, can you help us navigate through the next phase, inshallah? Yeah, bismillah I think uh, to, to just summarize, uh, Muslims have to totally even though some good things have come out of it, but the danger and the damage that we're seeing right now is so severe, Muslims have to totally, absolutely reject postmodernism and everything associated with it. Because at the end of the day, the whole postmodern project, be that uh, related to feminine studies that come out of it, queer studies, critical race theory, uh, now fat studies, all of it. Like I said, there's some good in there, but the, the project ultimately aims to center the margins. So all of these marginalized groups that claim historical oppression, be that around racial, gender, uh, whatever lines, the whole project is designed to destroy traditional society. And there's probably no society more traditional than Islam. And if Muslims do not reject it, it will, it will destroy Islam in this country. Not in the world, but in this country. And be, because, and a lot of people don't know this, but if you study deeply enough, one of the central figures, actually two central figures, Foucault and Deleuze, these, these people are deeply involved in the occult. And the ultimate objective in, in, in traditional, particularly Abrahamic society, who is most marginalized? I'm asking you guys. Huh? Who? Oh, you said women? Huh? Not, not in this context. 
And you said in Abrahamic religions. Right. No, but not in this context. Like women, that could be a candidate. The uh, LGBTQI plus could be candidates. Various racial ethnic groups, Native Americans, African Americans could be candidates. Uh, well, the most marginalized, in other words, the most unthinkable reality to be placed at the center of society, having been pushed to the margins, is Satan, Shaitan. And the ultimate end of the project is to center Shaitan. And what does that mean? It means to destroy and marginalize Abrahamic religion. And that's what's happening through all of these various doors. And so I, I don't use the language. You don't, you don't hear me talking about privilege and hegemony and intersectionality and allyship and all of this stuff. Be, because language is the gateway to your worldview. And that's why you see so many Muslims who are caught up in this worldview and as a result are leaving the religion either as active participants or altogether through this particular uh, path. So I would say that's one of the greatest challenges. And the way that we uh, avoid that is we have to hold fast to our language, we have to, to our religion, we have to hold fast to the language of scripture. You know, you know when, when, when people talk about the, the, the impact that the whole LGBTQI plus community has in our politics and society and our culture, uh, one of the projects was to take over the theology schools. I don't know if you've been recently to American Academy of Religion Conference. I went when it was in San Francisco because I was living out there. Let me go see. It was all Foucault. It was all postmodernism. There was no biblical language being spoken at all. There was no biblical language because the language of scripture is always going to be problematic for homosexuals. But the language of Foucault, who himself was a homosexual, is going to be empowering. And if you put that language in the theology schools and you replace the language of scripture, you're going to have a worldview that is conducive to redefining religion and the role of religion in society. And that's exactly what has happened and is happening and for Muslims to avoid it we have to reject the whole project we have to reject the language we we have to hold on and affirm our language one of Azizu's is his thesis like index of the ethical terms in Quran is that the Quranic language created a unique worldview and uh, Rosenthal the same thing in knowledge triumphant uh, Islam is the first knowledge-based civilization. And at the foundation of that knowledge is, uh, is, our, is our language. And if we, if we adopt another language to define the world and to define how we relate with each other as human beings, or we're inevitably going to end up with something that is not going to look uh, like Islam as we have historically known it. So that's a controversial statement, uh, but that's how I see it. So, Sheikh, this is obviously we all agree on this, but as they say, the devil is in the details. <laughs> so let this be the final question. I know it's getting Sometimes late for Sometimes the guys, devil is out in the open. That's true, too. Very valid point. Sheikh, uh, we all agree that we're not going to compromise on our theology and our language. We're not going to compromise on our morality. But in the political climate we live in, in order to gain our political freedoms to be Muslim, to fight Islamophobia, sometimes there are these marginalized groups that are willing to stand with us against the bigger bully in terms of politics. And they want to be on our platforms, and they're more than happy to support our political freedoms. And 
there is this perception, therefore, that by allying with them to fight our bigger battles in Islamophobia or maybe even, you know, politics or, or domestic or foreign policies, that we are compromising on our values. You understand what I'm saying, obviously, here? Yeah, absolutely. So can you, can you elaborate to the level of detail and explicitly you want? I'll leave it to you. You know, this is highly nuanced. It would best be dealt with in writing, so, so it, it makes it uh, less easier for people to misunderstand what you're saying. But, uh, you know, we, we are human beings. We have human relations. So I'm not, we, we don't, as Muslims, we don't encourage bullying. We don't encourage uh, people being uh, bullied, abused because of any particular attribute they might possess. So that's one thing. A lot of times when you say, uh, you know, no, if I said, for example, we shouldn't ally with these groups, some people, okay, then are you saying that we should reject them and abandon them and let them be bullied? No, we don't encourage that at all. But I think we have to step back and look at the context that this question is asked in. So I would, I would say, for example, why are we only asking this question now? And we weren't asking this question 20 years ago. Uh, has society changed so drastically that the enemies of Islam are so much more vicious or so much more threatening or so much more uh, dangerous today that we have to discuss uh, allying ourselves with various uh, marginal groups uh, that, that we didn't have to discuss allying ourselves with 20 years ago. What has happened in society? And so my argument would be exactly what I just said. What has happened has been really the, the fruits of the postmodern revolution have, have ripened and a, an entire generation of Muslim, particular Muslim academics, have gone through various levels of schooling, and to, including graduate school, under the influence of this uh, particular way of looking at the world, who are telling us we have to do this. And, and so that, that's what's changed. The religion didn't change. The enemies of, enemies of Islam didn't change. Our political system hasn't changed. But what has changed is how we Muslims, many of us, not all of us, view our situa situation politically and otherwise. So I'm not saying nay or yay. I'm saying we have to really step back and begin to analyze what's going on in our society before we encourage uh, Muslims to make these uh, various uh, decisions. Now saying that, I would say there are definitely areas uh, where we're going to find common cause with a lot of other people. For example, the preservation of the First Amendment that allows us freedom of speech, freedom of religion, etc. And so if I'm advocating for the preservation of First Amendment rights, and some other group whose ideas might be antithetical to my ideas are, are, are uh, advocating for the preservation of their rights. That's their constitutional duties. But I think what we have to be careful is understanding what is our business and what, what, are, our, what are our ultimate objectives and what is, what is most threatened by these potential alliances. So despite recently the, the great e Egyptian scholar, Sheikh Ali Juma, wanted to make the maqasid hifdul hayat over hifdul din. But that's, that's not a valid uh, switch because if, if you don't have din, if you don't have a connection to Allah, then life isn't worth living. And so when we're essentially saying to preserve our lives politically and perhaps even physically because people have to, uh, are getting so nasty, this might become very physically threatening. We have to place our religion in danger. And I, I think that's the issue. Like, 
are we legitimizing things that can end up either eroding or very rapidly undermining our religion and our attachment to our religion. And how we answer that question, I think, determines how we answer the question that you posed in terms of allying with various marginalized groups in society. This is the last thing I'll say is, for, for what I see out there, this is my opinion, that that necessity of alliance isn't based on a, a deep analysis of the maqasid of, of the religion, the, the uh, overarching objectives of the religion. is based by so many Muslims adopting the intersectional framework where uh, we are intersectionally connected with other marginalized groups. So you have the Muslims, you have the LGBTQ community, you have women, you have various racial and ethnic minorities, and this intersectionality creates natural allyship. But that allyship is not being defined by Muslims. That allyship is, is being defined by others. And from my experience, as soon as you uh, challenge certain aspects of the program or the agenda of others, you're viciously attacked, which indicates there's no true allyship to begin with because the, the, the foundations, the usul, are, are, are so different. So may Allah give us tawfiq. Well, I mean, and may Allah bless us to th these, qu these uh, questions demand answers but they have to be well-considered answers, and so that's my precursor to an answer, not an actual answer. Some people would take it as an answer, but you know what, at a certain point, we have to try to articulate the truth as best as we understand it, and just let the, let the chips fall where they may. And may Allah protect us and give us all tawfiq. I mean, I and mean, that's all of us. And you guys are fortunate and, and blessed to have Sheikh Yasser here. Uh, because in his life, he's younger than me. He's gone through a lot of, uh, seen a lot of things and done a lot of things and been exposed to a lot of intellectual religious currents. And so experiences, I, I would say to a lot of people who might say, oh, you used to do this and that. Uh, Muhammad Ali said a lot of profound things. Uh, and one of the things he said is that a person who is the same, views the world the same way, to paraphrase him, when he's 50, then he, that, 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 that he did when he was 20 has wasted 30 years of his life. And so we're, we're growing, we're evolving, we're, expo we're exposed to different things. What I might say on a particular issue, even a controversial one like we, we just uh, touched on, two years from now could be totally different. And so we just pray that Allah guides us to truth. Uh, well, I think one of the I most mean, relevant I mean. prayers, they're all relevant, but one of the most relevant prayers that our Prophet taught us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan. Oh Allah, show us truth as truth and bless us to follow it. And this is the beauty of Islam. This is one thing that I got from Islam in focus. Islam isn't just an idea, a pretty idea. It demands an ethical commitment. So not just knowing the truth, but following the truth. And not just recognizing falsehood, but shunning falsehood. And so we pray that Allah gives us all sound knowledge and blesses us Ameen. with the courage Ameen. to make ethical commitments yeah. and to make stands and to take stands even when they're unpopular. Ameen, Ameen. Zakmullah Khair Sheikh, we wanted to talk to you so much more. <laughs> yeah. yani, subhanAllah, Imam Zaid was the one who was with Muhammad Ali, uh, rahimahullah, to his end. He gave him the kalima at the very end. It was Imam Zaid that was there. He gave him the kalima. Imam Zaid spoke at Muhammad Ali's funeral as the Sheikh and Imam of Muhammad Ali. So much more can be said, but time is limited, Sheikhana. But I need to extract a promise from you that you're going to come back to our community, oh, inshallah. Definitely. You, inshallah. You have my word, inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakumullah Khair Sheikhana for coming all this way here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
to give you life and a long life and uh, allow you to be a beacon and a role model for all of us. May Allah Azza wa Jal continue to, continue to increase your iman and your taqwa and your good deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the best of your years, the, the final years. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause your uh, amal to be accepted by your his servants and by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you a kalimatul tawheed at the end of your life. All of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the shafa'ah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment. May Allah azza wa jalla resurrect us under his shade when there is no shade other than his shade. May Allah azza wa jalla cause us to pass over the sirat with firmness and strength. May Allah allow us to be amongst the first of the batches to enter Jannah with radiant faces. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the companionship of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannatul Firdaus al-A'la. Wa jazakumullahu khayran. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا مُهِينًا وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَا اكْتَسَبُوا فَقَدِ احْتَمَلُوا بُهْتَانًا وَإِثْمًا مُبِينًا Yeah. Uh...